May these words be spoken and heard in the power of God. Amen. We've got a challenging set of readings today. We've been off doing other things um, with the big uh, combined service a couple of weeks ago, and then we had the Feast of the Transfiguration last week. But in the meantime, the Old Testament readings in the lecture have been going through week by week. As we trace episodes out of the not very successful at times dynasty of David, who had everything going for him and seemed messed up. You might know something like that. And what we're hearing in these stories um, are some of the ways in which what should have been a life of blessing turned out to be a much more challenging and, and confused situation. So there's a whole lot of stuff that we just heard, because the reading is so long, we just heard a few excerpts a little bit bumpy at times in terms of the narrative transition. Meanwhile, over in Gospel Land, for the last several weeks we've been reading through, or at least the lecture has been wanting us to be reading through John chapter 6, and we've been doing other things. And today we heard the last of that. As there's a long extended metaphor or you know, reflection in John chapter 6 on the metaphor of Jesus as the bread of heaven, the bread or the food which came down from heaven for a hungry world. What I want us to do is to focus actually on the second reading, the letter to the Ephesians. And our theme sentence for the liturgy today comes from the end of that reading. You'll find it on the top, very top of page two in the service booklet. Be imitators of God as beloved children and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Doesn't that sound sweet? Okay. Just what every Christian life is like and what every church you've ever been to. Exactly like that. So it was a bit of a surprise to hear what actually preceded those words when we got to the second reading. And it was uh, uh, apparently a bit of an interesting bunch of people in the Ephesian church or the church in the city of Ephesus. We don't even have to read between the lines to see what a mess they were. It's hiding in plain sight. So the writer, whether it's Paul or somebody else from his kind of community, Paul starts out by saying, stop lying to each other. What? Okay. These are fine Christian people, okay? But they were known, they were famous for lying, for not speaking honestly with each other, such that nobody could trust anything that the church people said to them because they were inclined to misrepresent the truth. And it gets worse. Okay? But that's not a good start, is it? Apparently, they were also inclined to arc up and to eat each other and have ferocious arguments. And so they're told to stop being so angry with each other. And in particular, if you're gonna be angry, okay, feel seriously passionate about something, if it really matters that much to you. But, and we've all heard these words, passion our grandmother, do not let the sun go down on your anger. You might have a fierce disagreement with somebody, even inside the church. It's been known to happen once or twice in the last 2,000 years. But the sun goes down. And the next day is a fresh day. Put a line underneath it. Don't carry a grudge from one argument to another, from one parish council meeting to another. <laughs> now, I'm here so, I've only been here such a short time, I don't know if this stuff happens here, okay? So I'm just talking about what's there in the scriptures. So the way it's described in Ephesians, there's nothing wrong with having strong opinions and even expressing them forcefully, but literally there needs to be a sunset clause. We need to be able to draw a line under our disagreements. It gets better. 
Some of them were apparently thieves. Still. Okay? Doesn't say once upon a time some of you were robbers. It says some of you are thieves. This is the church members, okay? Not the people coming to the food ministry, not the people coming into the upshot. The church members were thugs who were beating up people and stealing from them. I mean, you just want to join a church like that, don't you? And it seems they haven't yet given up their stealing habits, but they're told that the time has come to do so. And for them, repentance is not only going to include stop stealing the stuff, but it's going to mean a whole new focus, getting a job, having some assets themselves, so they can provide for the people in need, rather than nicking stuff all the time. And then there was the gossip in a church. Really? Do we need to ask? Loose lips don't only sink ships, they also damage people and they destroy churches. So the people are told their words are to be acts of grace for those who hear them, rather than spiritual poison that seeps from one soul into another. And they were told that they were to embrace a whole new set of values. Instead of bitterness, wrath, anger, wrangling, slander and malice, I don't think we put those words in the parish profile, did we? But this is what the church in Ephesus had in their parish profile, according to the person who wrote this letter. So instead of bitterness, wrath, anger, wrangling, slander, and just plain old-fashioned malice, what a fun church they must have been, they were to be kind to one another, tender-hearted and forgiving one another, which is a bit of a makeover for the church in Ephesus, a genuine conversion. Yet this bunch of misfits, bitter, wrathful, angry, wrangling, always talking badly about each other and just plain malicious, these are the people addressed by that theme sentence we heard earlier. These people, these liars, cantankerous, corrupt gossips are the ones called beloved children and called by the apostle to live together in love. So as the ancient colleague once said, it does indeed seem that God thinks more highly of us than we deserve. In the life together, the Christians in Ephesus were being called to reflect what they and we see in God and what we see in Jesus. Selfless love. Now, had I been here long enough to see one of your arguments in this parish, or had I been here long enough to see a grudge being carried from one moment of conflict to another, this would be a really tough sermon to give. But I can pretend that doesn't happen here. And you're chuckling nervously. Okay. No matter how good or how bad things have been in the past, the call for conversion and a fresh start is very clear in today's readings. If we want to kill this parish, today's reading gives us a checklist of nasty attributes to set loose in our community. And that spiritual poison will kill this place stone dead. And if we want to renew and refresh this parish as we wait for our new priests to be appointed, and as we prepare ourselves for what's coming next in the story of this church, then today's reading is also very clear. So the kind of simple question in a way is, what kind of reputation do we want this faith community to have around town here in this church? It's ours to create and it's ours to destroy. Have we earned a reputation 
as genuine people who care for each other and look out for the needy. Are we building a church community where others can say, those people at St Paul's, they actually act like Jesus. The ball's in our court, isn't it? As today's theme sentence says, be imitators of God as beloved children and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Amen.